La entrevista de hoy es con Wolfgang Bauer. Wolfgang es uno de los creadores de Cobol Press. Cobol Press es quizás la editorial más importante ahora de contenido de lo que antes se llamaba Third Party de D&D, pero recientemente más conocido por haber sacado su nuevo juego después del escándalo de la OGL, Tales of the Valiant. Vamos a conocer un poco cómo empezó en su carrera, primero como escritor freelance, después como editor, cómo surgió Cobol Press, cómo empezó a publicar cosas y eventualmente salió lo que primero se conoció como Project Black Flag y luego Tales of the Valiant. Y también nos va a contar de un nuevo producto que tiene en un Kickstarter al cual todavía podés apoyar. También hay algún tip para quienes quieran empezar su carrera como escritores en este ámbito. Quédate ahí, míralo, esta entrevista con Wolfgang Bauer de Cobol Press. So, to, to break the ice, Wolfgang. Uh, how did you start your career as a writer for RPGs? Uh, I mean, when did you when did you decide that you wanted to do this? You wanted to to write for this kind of of games? Uh, I always enjoyed writing my own things, writing my homebrew, uh, playing with my friends. But I did not think of it as a career uh, for a very long time. I published a few adventures in Dungeon Magazine uh, back in the 80s, um, a very long time ago, <laughs> but, um, but you know, it was a hobby, and, and until I went to uh, college and kept writing and just sending things to magazines and seeing things published in, in small ways, um, I was convinced I would have a career as a biochemist. Um, so that was what I pursued in my studies um, at the university, and I got my degree, and I went on to graduate work, and I kept writing um, until the day my friend Steve from Puerto Rico, uh, of Puerto Rican background, he uh, he said, you know that they're hiring. And I said, who? The Dungeons and Dragons people, they're hiring. You should apply. And I said, That's very flattering, Steve. Very nice of you to say. But no, I, uh, I I don't think I should. And he said, well, then I will. And I said, I can't let this happen, right? So I applied, and um, and he went on to pursue an excellent career in engineering. <laughs> I went on to work uh, for TSR and, and Wizards of the Coast. That is when I really decided, um, sort of in my early 20s, that I would move uh to Lake Geneva, Wisconsin and work in role playing games full time. Wow. <laughs> What, uh... I'm... Yeah. I mean it was a strange move. I was moving <laughs> from New York into the midwestern tiny tourist town of, you know, 6000 people. In winter, it was very quiet. There was nothing to do but work on role-playing games. So it was very good time <laughs> to focus on my career. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> a very prolific environment. <laughs> yes. Yes, it was. So in many interviews, you've said that you love those black and white magazines or booklets. Yes. And then you ended up publishing Cobalt Quarterly. And yes. we were... Um, And you were involved in many publications. What yeah. is it that you love about magazines and, and those little books? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, it was my first job professionally in, in the field was working on magazines. And it, I love it for two reasons. It taught me something very valuable. It taught me um, that you need to ship the magazine, right? You need to meet a schedule. It was relentless. If we were one day late with the magazine one month, that was one day less we had next month. There is no fighting the calendar, right? Mm -hmm. um, you, you won't win against it. Uh, so we were very disciplined in our writing, editing, layout, proofreading. Everything we did to produce role-playing magazines was, um, was very timely. And so one of the things I loved about it was it taught me schedule deadlines uh the other thing i loved about it was as a reader because that's kind of what i got the most of, of sort of new content it's hard to think of now but before role-playing games were 
you know, PDFs and Roll20 platform or anything on the internet. They were printed objects at local stores, bookstores, and you got a magazine every month. You might not get a hardcover role-playing book more than once a year. So it was frequent. And it meant I had a wonderful surprise in the mailbox once I started to subscribe to the magazines. And it got me excited to play, right? Um, and that's what I tried to do with Cobalt Quarterly. Is that we didn't do it every month, right? Four times a year. We tried to get people excited about role-playing. To say, here's an interview with, you know, Dave Arneson. Or here is, um, you know... Arch Devils by Ed Greenwood, something like this. Um, and you never know what you're going to get. That sense of surprise in a magazine is like, well, I've paid my money, I've subscribed. Boy, I hope it's good this month. <laughs> um, so, sorry, uh, you were to say something? No. Okay, okay. Go. Um, this, is, this is just an improvised question I have to ask. Do you guys have time to play? Well, <laughs> and that is always a problem, right? <laughs> that has been a problem since the beginning of professional role-playing writers <laughs> and editors. And the truth is, we are, of course, turning our hobby into our business. But most people who stick around love it enough to play anyway, right? Like, I still, I played a... Uh, Was it Friday or something? Yeah, it was this last weekend, right? Um, and my Call of Cthulhu game went for years. And, and most of the people I know in the role-playing field still play. The interesting thing is sometimes you don't play your own role-playing game. I played... a When I was at TSR working on Dungeons and Dragons uh, and at Wizards of the Coast later... I played games by <laughs> Chaosium or White Wolf, right? <laughs> um, or I played Star Wars from West End Games because I had been working on Dungeons and Dragons all day, right? Yeah. Um, and now at Cobalt Press, well, I still play uh, D&D, but once in a while we haul out, you know, RuneQuest or Cthulhu or or something new, some indie game, just to try it out. Um, but yeah, it's hard to keep up with the field if you're not playing at least some of the new things. Right. So now back to the questions. Um, yeah. Is it true that you were one of the first person to receive a query by Chris Perkins? Uh, a, a query? No, I think he was actually published... So I've claimed this in the past that I was one of the first to see his work. And I think he has actually, I went back and looked it up recently. I think he published something before I got to Dungeon Magazine. He published like one piece before that. But I didn't know this. I saw his thing in a query pile of paper letters. I said, this guy's great. And I gave it to my boss. And she said, yeah, he is great. And I, <laughs> and if she had been, Maybe if her memory had been better, she would have said, he's so great, we published him, you know, eight months ago. Uh, this is his second query. But, <laughs> but he really stood out. His stuff, his maps are very sharp. His his pitch was very good. Um, and, you know, I didn't know who he was. I had no idea he would have this massive career at Wizards of the Coast and sort of define Dungeons and Dragons over many years. But um, But there were a number of writers like that. You would you would get their pitch, <laughs> and you would say, "Well, yeah, we want that one. That's fantastic. Who is this?" Right? And does uh, the industry still work that way? I mean, uh, how uh, does a, a writer get to work in the TTRPG um, industry nowadays? It has changed completely, right? Nobody sends paper envelopes to a mailbox. That's, that's, <laughs> No, that's very, very much a thing of the past and has been for 20 years. Um, these days, I, I think there are, I mean, you should ask some young writers how they got their first break, but I think there are two or three paths. One of them is 
you know, get out on social media, blog something, put up some self-published pieces uh, on, you know, on your website or, or on one of the big platforms um, and see if anybody likes it. Or you could start with a, a group of friends, start a small company, go all indie, put stuff out there, see how, you, how it goes. Um, there's nothing like the magazines exactly, I and mean, they're sort of our magazines, but they're they're not a road straight to the Wizards of the Coast door. They won't get you a job at Cobalt Press, right? They're... The other thing that has happened at Cobalt Press now, of course, is we still put out open calls. Um, three times a year we have a Kickstarter, and probably twice a year those Kickstarters include a Hey, if you back this project, send us a pitch for, you know, send us your best spell or send us a monster or send us something. And we get a thousand people sending us their best monster or their best spell. And we take some of them, 40, 50, 60 of those, and we, we put them in a hardcover, right? And that's their first publication. And some of those people who kind of walked in by... I mean, it's an open call for talent, right? And it's all judged double blind, right? Your name won't help you. Um, all of the author names are taken off those manuscripts and they're handed to judges. And sometimes, hilariously, we have our own freelancers show up and <laughs> like, wait a minute, <laughs> you shouldn't be, a, you don't need an open call. You could just call us and say, Hey, I'm free. Do you have any work for me? But you know, they, they were goofing around, seeing if their stuff was good enough to get past the judges. But that is how some of our current regular writers got their start. They just said, hey, "I'm gonna back a Kickstarter and see if I can join the open call." So, tell us a, a little bit about how you made that. A jump from being a, a writer, from being a, an editor, to being a, the lead of Open Design and well, what uh, would soon become uh, Cobalt Press. Uh, how yeah. how did this uh, change happen? How did you end up in what is now Cobalt Press? Oh yes. Um, I mean, I worked in the magazines. Then I worked at Wizards of the Coast in the role playing game department. Uh, then I went out of role-playing games for a while, pursued other things, and sort of worked as a freelancer for Paizo and others. I had done writing, I had done uh, editing, I had done game development. Um, but you're right, I had not done any work as a publisher or organizing uh, my own publications. And I think my stupidity served me well here. I said... <laughs> I'm Sure that the writing and the editing are the hardest part of publishing any creative work and you know getting cover art or doing layout how hard can that be <laughs> 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 or running a business right like that having you know contracts and printers uh, i'm sure i can figure it out and um, I did. I did figure it out, mostly by making every possible mistake uh, in self-publishing, right? So if you study the, the history of the first five years of open design, you'll see that I released products, uh, mostly ones I wrote and some that I had collaborators with. And sometimes those open calls, right? People who just wanted to step up and write something. Or friends of mine from my days at, at Wizards of the Coast would say, hey, I'll write a little. Um, but, but mostly I wasn't doing very well because I wasn't good at promoting it. I well, didn't know anything about art and graphics. I didn't know anything about printing and distributing work. I didn't know what it all cost. So I spent five years learning it. Um, and at that point, my accountant came to me and said, if you keep losing money, you can't call it a business. You have to call it a hobby. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean it's a... He says, you're just losing money. This is just like you playing Warhammer 40k, right? Like, you would spend money on your hobby, but you're not making any money. <laughs> and I said, oh, so I actually have to make money next year. And they said, yes, yes, you do. Or you, 
you know, you don't get any tax break for being a business if you're just a money loser. You're bankrupt. <laughs> I always uh, advice. Yeah, it was good advice. I was like, yeah, you're right. Making money is an important part of the business. <laughs> and I had been doing it on the side, evenings and weekends. And, you know, I, did, I had an account, a bookkeeper. And she was like, yeah, you're pretty much losing money. Like, this quarter you made money. You made money right here for three months. I'm like, good. How do I do that again? Um, and fortunately, by this point, I had been online and talking to people. And, you know, if it were, if it had been... 15 years later or 10 years later, I would have been on YouTube chatting to people, but I was chatting on community boards and I asked the customers, well, what do you want? And they told me, I said, all right, let's do one of those. Um, so eventually I hired help, right? People who are actually good at things like graphic design, um, layout, print publication, um, you know, uh, someone to help promote the things uh, someone to run a web store um all things i did badly and and at that point i kind of had been forced to stop writing quite so much and focus more on business and and i became a publisher the same way most publishers do which is you know uh fail 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 lose money until such time as you have a hit and that's that's what it all changes, right? Um, suddenly you can say, we've had one hit, how did we do it? And nobody knows, and you say, let's do it again. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. yeah that's, that's amazing. <laughs> I, I wish there were one clean secret that I could share with the world. <laughs> I think everyone who writes a book of business advice is like, I have a secret. And everyone wants to know what it is. I think it's different for every industry, right? For me, I think what really made Cobalt Press jump from a hobby that was sort of struggling to, um, to a serious business was uh, a couple of books early on um, did well enough. Um, on Kickstarter. And I think that's really where things changed around. Because as everybody listening here probably knows, right? Like with Kickstarter, the money goes to the creative team um, with a lot, out a lot of intermediaries. And all of a sudden we could publish books in color, in hardcover, uh, and in much larger quantities that actually fit the size of the audience that wanted them. That was a huge change for us. That's amazing. That's that's a that's a quite a journey. Quite a journey. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I love learning. I love doing new things. I think part of my drive toward publishing my own work was just trying to understand how it was done. And then I would look around at people like oh, I don't know Eric Mona over at Paizo, who's very good at this work, right? Yeah. Um, or others and, and said, well, I'll just do what they're doing or something like what they're doing. So what, which one was that first hit? It depends. <laughs> uh, you can go back to the Kickstarter history. There's a few that sort of bump around, right? Um, I would say the one that really kind of took off. Oh. I don't know. Tome of Beasts is the one which allowed me to hire other people, right? That was for fifth edition. Uh, Cobalt Press was there very early. Cobalt Press had been asked to write Horde of the Dragon Queen as an outside design studio, right? Um, by Wizards of the Coast. So I'm, I'm still very proud of the fact that Cobalt Press logos there in the, uh, yeah. in the Horde of the Dragon Queen. Uh, credits pages um, but you know that one I think is what really turned it into uh, we have a staff <laughs> but there were earlier products um, which were Pathfinder books right like Tome of Beasts was in it funded like in the year 2015 I want to say um, but the one where we went from 
you know, a $10,000 Kickstarter to a $150,000 Kickstarter, um, you know, that, I don't know, that could have been uh, deep magic for Pathfinder. Um, because that was 2013 or so. Um, and that hardcover was big and full of great material for Pathfinder players and um, it, it stayed in print for the better part of ooh, it's not in print anymore but yeah it's hard to say exactly when you turn the corner but that was one of the first hardcovers we did if not you know the first yeah. hardcover so um, coming here in time like in recent mm -hmm. times like this year sure. oh <laughs> this, was, this year this was yes. quite a year we started uh, <laughs> 2023 <laughs> with the ogl scan and all of that yes yeah so when did you first hear about what watsi was trying to do and what was the reaction like at cobalt press well, it depends on what you mean when we first heard it. There were rumors back in 2022, going as far back as Gen Con, August of 22. There were rumors that, uh, you know, something might change or that there were discussions happening. But yeah, how much, how seriously do you want to take rumors, right? We, we heard it. Uh, Cobalt staffers uh, in Indianapolis at Gen Con said, oh, okay, well, this rumor is going around. Uh, we talked among ourselves and said, should we do something? And the answer was, well, this won't happen, but let's talk about it for a couple hours and make a plan, right? Like, nobody would be foolish enough to change this license that seems to be working for everyone. But just in case, what if it went away? And in part, I was remembering the fourth edition um, licensing, GTL. which, yeah, which was quite different than the OGL and was a huge failure uh, from a licensing perspective. Like we did one product, maybe two products for fourth edition. Um, because the licensing was very restrictive and we're like, I think we'd rather do Pathfinder at that point. Um, but yes, we, we thought about it some, we, we put some plans in place. We, we started up a what if kind of team and, and worked around a little bit well here's what we could do right we could go back to pathfinder we could do this we could do that we could make our own game um and it wasn't until later in the year that it became clear that something really was happening and and that there was an effort afoot to to change um what the whole industry thought was a not changeable license um and i don't need to rehash the whole history of like January and February there, it was a really rough time. A lot of um, colleagues in the role-playing industry were very unclear whether their company was going to continue forward, whether they were going to be hiring a lot of lawyers for the next year, uh, whether they should go find another sort of job, whether they should keep staff around, right? Like, is it worth going forward if this all happens? Like, people were pretty concerned and pretty upset. Uh, and then when Wizards of the Coast said, well, we're putting the SRD out into Creative Commons, here you go, We've, we, <laughs> we're not changing that. Um, that was a huge opportunity, right? Suddenly it was possible for Cobalt Press to say, do you want to play D&D without Hasbro? Well, <laughs> that's entirely possible, right? We have the core rule engine out in a publicly accessible way with the Creative Commons. That's fantastic. Um, and we took what we had been sort of working on slowly for a few months and we put as much jet fuel behind it as we could. And that became Tales of the Valiant, um, which is sort of what I just described, right? You can play D&D and you can have a complete open license to the material and it doesn't involve Hasbro in any way. It's it's uh, it's derived from that Creative Commons material, and it's it is well along in playtest, 
we've released an alpha we've released five or six playtest uh drops of material they're all free um yeah it's going very well we have fifty thousand play testers it's uh it's lovely Whoa. but it was a huge shift in the industry right suddenly cobalt press was in a position where we could say oh well we're going to take the rules that we've been working with for eight or nine years as fifth edition we're going to put a cobalt press spin on it we're going to reinvent the bits that we feel aren't in the creative commons material uh, and we're going to share it with the community and you know, a dozen other publishers have signed up um, 10,000 fans said yeah here's here's a pledge on Kickstarter go to it make this thing happen and um, I I wasn't sure how it would be received but I don't think we could have asked for better in terms of community support uh, it's just the playtest feedback has been great uh, and then we ran several hundred tables we ran more tables at Gen Con than everybody except like Pathfinder and Cthulhu I, I forget right we ran a great many people through our first playtests at Gen Con this past year and um, we got more feedback we got more people interested I think as it rolls out next year we'll see it grow and grow um, and it will become an interesting little corner of the tabletop world. So, yeah, um, I spend a lot of time working on those core rules um, and making sure that they're ready. But really, it's Celeste Konowich, our senior game designer, who is leading the charge there. Uh, and there's a whole team of about eh, 10 people. Um, working in different ways plus like i said tens of thousands of play testers that's, that's, that's amazing we, yeah i i don't if you had told me 10 years ago that this was going to be possible i would have said no that's that's so unlikely <laughs> <laughs> you're crazy yeah, yeah. right I, like uh that that no but it's uh it's a reality now and it means uh more wonderful things for tabletop players right so i have to ask something you, you sure. know that's that uh when you have this rumor so you say well it's not going to happen but here's an email about it um right <laughs> so why the name project black flag oh um i think it was a couple of different things. Um, there's three explanations for it. Um, one is, uh, of course, Black Flag, the punk band, Henry Rollins and Friends, right? Um, it's like a very do-it-yourself punk attitude to role-playing games is, okay, fine. You know, you don't want to give us a major record contract? We'll just record our own stuff and tour relentlessly. Um, so it was do it yourself is sort of what black flag means. Of course, the other one is, uh, pirates and anarchists, right? <laughs> Raise a black flag, which like, well, we're saying that after eight years of being one of the major third party publishers for fifth edition D and D, we are going to sail away and chart our own course, right? We're going to do our own thing. So hoist our own flag. Um, and the third one is the most cynical. Uh, there is a an English uh, writer, or was, by the name of H.L. Mencken, uh, who had a, <laughs> had a take on uh, when you've had enough. I think the quote is something like, every once in a while, a man has to stand back, spit on his hands, raise the black flag and start slitting throats <laughs> which, <laughs> which is sort of maybe a little too aggressive for what we had in mind <laughs> but it was sort of like okay we've been around and around with this license maybe we should just maybe we should stop being a supporter of someone else and make our own thing yeah. um so those it are the is, three stories. It is, after all, uh, 5e with 
teeth and claws. <laughs> yes, it is. It's a 5e with... I mean, I say Cobalt Spin. I think in a lot of ways it takes things that have been issues with the mechanics for many years and and tries to address them. And in most cases, I think we've been successful. The playtest has shown us when we're not successful. Um, we're basically just hot rodding and kit bashing and improving uh, the parts that everyone complains about. And we're trying to leave things alone if they don't need to be fixed. Because a large part of, you know, fifth edition D&D, most successful edition ever, don't mess it up. Um, so Tales of the Valiant and Project Black Flag is, uh, we want to keep what's great about it and just put some new things around um, the outsides and, and in the places where it's not covered in that Creative Commons document. We're getting there. <laughs> so in some interviews you some years ago, you said that you wanted Cobalt Press to be recognized among third-party publishers. Mm -hmm. But now d and is under Creative Commons, you have published uh, everything we, we just talked about. And one of your designers, uh, Mike Shi, has mm -hmm. even proposed to stop talking about third party or first party publishers. Yep. What is the vision of Cobalt Press right now? What is the main objective? Uh, is Well, yeah, I mean, for many years, we saw ourselves first as a third party publisher for Pathfinder First Edition. And then after 2015, as a first party, a uh, third party publisher for for Wizards of the Coast and, and Dungeons and Dragons, right? So we, we have been very clear for a long time that we expand and support other company systems with Project Black Flag, Black Flag Role Playing. Uh, Tales of the Valiant is meant to be a first party system and that's why I'm so happy we have a dozen partner companies saying, oh, we'd like to use your system too. Um, it means that we are effectively a first party publisher for this system um and we can put forward the player's guide and the monster vault and supplements but we're not the only ones because it's open gaming material anyone can take that rule set and do the same um and since we're providing that open license to the material it's yeah we are in that first party publisher realm just like you know chaosium or Money Cook Games or Green Runny, pick your favorite, right? Um, and that comes both with uh, great opportunities to sort of steer the rules and the, uh, the community in certain ways around here's what we're offering, uh, but also responsibilities to, to continue to support uh, not just our own material, but people who are homebrewing off that rule set uh, and people who are publishing um, Black Flag compatible uh, adventures, uh, supplements, monster tomes, all of those things. So yeah, we want to make that easy for everyone. And uh, so far it seems it's working out. We're, we're uh, talking to those partners frequently. Um, and I, I can't announce all of what they're up to, but they have... <laughs> They've already committed to more than, uh, you know, more than I I feared early on. It was, well, will anybody else want the system? And the answer is, oh, goodness, yes. So um, it's become clear that we will have uh, Tales of the Valiant products from Cobalt Press, and we will have others that are uh, compatible items from a range of people doing other sorts of products. So, talking about products, one of the most cherished products of Gold Press are the guides. Yes. When did you first get the idea to make those compilations of essays on different subjects? Well, the Cobalt guides were <laughs> a happy accident. I had been writing essays uh, in a blog format um in the very early days of cobalt press we published maybe two books a year right 
because it was a very tiny team and I didn't know how to do layout and everything took longer than I thought it should, right? It was like once or twice a year we'd publish an adventure or a supplement. Um, but that meant for six months of the year, I had an audience that was like, so what are you doing now? And I would say, oh, I don't know. I'm thinking deep thoughts about, I don't know, adventure design. And they'd say, well, why don't you share your deep thoughts with us? I'd say, here, I'll write an essay and you guys can tell me how I'm wrong. Um, and that's where those that essay series started. I would write one or two essays a month, maybe. Some of them are still up on LiveJournal. Um, and, and at some point somebody said, well, you know, you have all these essays. Could I get them? Could you compile them for me, please? Um, so that I can read them, you know, as a single document. And I was like, well, you could compile them. What do you need me for? Mm -hmm. He said, no, I don't, I don't want to. That's work. And, you know, lay it out nice. Put a cover on it. I'll pay $2. And, and I said, well, okay, someone has just given me an idea to collect essays that I've, you know, already been writing anyway. What happens? So that became the Cobalt Guide to Game Design Volume 1. And I did get a nice cover from John Hodgson for it. And then there was volume two and volume three. And before long, it wasn't just me writing them. We got other people with different opinions writing them. And then we won an Origins Award because Richard Garfield uh, and Mike Selinker and all those other folks wrote the Cobalt Guide to Board Game Design. Um, and then it started getting used in universities and colleges. And before you know it, we've got like eight of these things. And the authors include Margaret Weiss and Gail Simone and you know, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, Keith Baker and Luke Gygax. So sure, why not? It uh, it started as I would like to explain the design process to people who um, weren't given the opportunity to look behind the curtain at that time, right? Like most game designers don't try to explain how they do it. And what I learned by trying to explain it was, oh, I don't actually know how I do some of what I do. I have to think about it. <laughs> um, and other parts, I'm like, of course it's that way. That is exactly the way I was taught to do adventure design by um, by the, the people who had been doing it for 20 years at, uh, you know, Lake Geneva and at Wizards of the Coast. I mean, I was fortunate to learn from people like Kim Mohan, um, and and Roger Moore and Jonathan Tweet, who all shared what they knew about game design. And some of those hints and ideas worked their way into my essays. The most recent one of these Cobalt Guides is called the Cobalt Guide to Dungeons. Um, I adore it. Uh, Aaron Roberts, who just won a Diana Jones Award as you know, best emerging young designer, um, is one of the essayists in there. Uh, but I think it's it's like a real mix of old school and new school voices. So that one, I'm especially proud of the new guide every year. And we, we try to do one a year. The idea is just, you know, you can do this yourself. Here's some hints or here's some inspiration. Um, and so far it's working because people keep picking them up. So going back to, to Cobalt Press uh, right now, how... Sure. How would you define success for Tales of the Violent? I mean, you, you got a, a hugely popular uh, Kickstarter. Uh, a lot of people are playtesting it. But yeah. for you, you personally, what, what for would me you say? personally? Yes, what ah. would you say uh, or what would you um, like to see to truly say? Perhaps you already think that, and I mean, you kind of. Uh, already said it okay. but what what does success look like for tales of the valiant and for cobalt press in the sure comic? i mean for tales of the valiant success looks like we put out a set of rules that people embrace and and use and find you know worth expanding through the open gaming license um or the open gaming community and I mean, Wizards gave a huge gift to the community by saying we're putting the core rules in there. Cobalt said, we want that to be in print. We want it to be in play. We want it on people's tabletops. And we want to make sure 
that there will be no changes to the licensing regime and anybody can jump in, right? It's meant to be an open pool. And I talked earlier about the open calls and how you get your start. If Tales of the Valiant, five years from now, you guys are talking to some young designer who says, well, you know, I got my start with some playtest packets for this thing, Tales of the Valiant, and everybody knows what that is now. But at the time, it was just this crazy playtest idea. <laughs> Right? And that's where I got my start as a role-playing game designer was with Tales of the Valiant. That would be success, right? That would be wonderful if that were someone's first game um, and it launched their role-playing game career five or ten years from now. Um, because that's, that's how a game system or a game community thrives, right? Is It's not just that the rules are good and people use them, but then someone else comes along and says, it's been a few years, and I like what they did back when. Um, this is basically, I'm telling the story of who I imagine is writing Tales of the Valiant 2nd Edition. Right? <laughs> Somebody who right now doesn't even think of themselves as a game designer. Somebody who thinks of themselves as, I'm just playing with my friends, and I'm going to have a career as a chemist, right? I'm not, this is not a job. This is just fun. Um, and, and maybe, maybe they will find it's a career. Um, so that's one way to see success. Uh, for Cobalt Press, I mean, it's clear the company has always kind of put its eggs in the basket of, you want to have players and game masters control their own homebrew campaigns. We publish campaign settings and they're great. But the Cobalt Guides and the Campaign Builder products, where we say, here's tools to make your own world shine. Wow, those are the things that get me excited at Cobalt Press, because our worlds are terrific. But even back in the early days, it was, hey, dear, dear player at home, you know, don't be intimidated. You can step up from being uh, a player to a game master. You can go from being a game master to a game designer. You can go from being a game designer to being a published game designer, right? Like, these things are all possible if, if it brings you joy and if you bring something to the community that everybody finds, well, delightful and valuable, right? So... Kobolds aren't often thought of as delightful, but that's what we're aiming for. We want to be delightful. <laughs> wow. So, now, today, right right here and right now, you're currently running a Kickstarter for yes. Castles and Crowns. It's yes. a new book in the Campaign Builder, Builder series. Yes. It's, uh, first of all, uh, uh, sorry, first of all, for people who perhaps haven't heard about this before, what are the campaign builder books? Sorry for my spelling. <laughs> no, no, that's great. Uh, the campaign builder is... I'll tell you what it really is. Campaign builder is a response to the critique we got of the Cobalt Guides. Everybody loves the Cobalt Guides. It's inspirational. You give me great ideas. I love it. And the only complaint was, I wish you gave me a lot more mechanics in the cool. I wish there were a lot more rules. Like, and I'm sitting here saying, Richard Garfield is explaining to you how to do board game design, and that's not good enough. Okay, fine, <laughs> fine, fine. Um, you know, Margaret Weiss is telling you how to plot a campaign arc and Cobalt Guide to Plots and Camp. That's not good enough. Okay, we'll put in more rules, but it's not a Cobalt Guide anymore. It's a campaign builder. And so what it, these are meant to do, the whole series is meant to say, we take a part of your campaign, something that's in any fantasy role-playing game, um, like cities and towns, castles and kingdoms, other things like this, and we give you a hardcover book and a set of beautiful, wet, dry erase, like enormous battle maps. Um, that's what's in the Kickstarter. And what these tools do is they tell you, well, how do you make your city or town more interesting? How do you grow it? Who are the most interesting people? How do you plan a campaign around it? What are some new monsters that are unique to a castle environment or the aristocracy? Um, Castles and Crowns is meant to take all of that 
embedded royalty feudal lore uh, of typical fantasy and and make it more playable right um, here's a background that shows what a, a heroic character looks like who's also an impoverished noble or here's what uh, here's a a monster an NPC set of stats uh, for a courtly wizard and here's a chart of all the secrets plots quests and favors that wizard has right so if you have a group wandering up to the nearest castle or palace or hunting lodge uh, you have a whole book that says here are ways to turn that into a really compelling part of your home game it's not specific to uh, a cobalt press world or any published setting uh, it's all meant to be used uh, in any fantasy game so what we see with castles and crowns and with the cities and towns book before it was we see people show up they say i like what you're doing here it sounds useful but i run and then they name their favorite game system right like how much of this is still useful to me and the answer is probably about 80 85 like you know the stat blocks for monsters and npcs won't be great and downtime rules for fifth edition or tales of the valiant are pretty specific but Everything about planning a campaign, all those adventure hooks, all those NPCs, the guilds, the organizations, the how to run a royal family, the kingdom character sheet, um, that's not specific to rules, right? So all of those encounter building things um, are useful for any game. And we're hoping to do, yeah, I mean, the Castles and Crown Kickstarter is already doing better than the cities and towns ones, I guess chivalry is not dead people do want to have some jousting rules and taxation and you know um uh, some maps of the castle dungeons and keeps uh it's going well and i think that means we might do a third one sometime down the line but i, I mean i'm an american we don't have castles and we've never had a we haven't had a kingdom on our soil so it's all exotic and strange for us i think there's an audience just because um i think there's an audience just because it's a wonderful uh part of storytelling for fantasy is who are these aristocrats and nobles are they friends are they villains um what do you do with them and my fear is Americans kind of fumble around with that because it's familiar to us from stories, um, but it's not familiar to us from, oh, I don't know, the British royal family. So I think <laughs> it's in the tabloids, and I think tabloid stories actually make good tabletop role-playing <laughs> stories. <laughs> it's a scandal. You're going to have to go find that scroll and burn it. Or the prince will be embarrassed, right? It's great for intrigue campaigns. Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. There's a whole section on intrigue. There's a section on sieges and warfare. There's a section on uh, how, you know, an heir is chosen and ritual magic to empower that heir. There's a whole section on royal magic, um, how to make the divine right of kings sort of an arcane thing or a uh, right a matter of magic and you don't have to take any of those suggestions into your campaign but they're all neat ideas um and if you do have a big court of royal elves or royal humans um castles and crowns will make your game better immediately uh you just have a lot of ideas at your doorstep so people can uh, support castles, castles and crowns right now it's on kickstarter but we do want to know what else can we expect from Cobalt Press in the near future? I mean, what, what sure. can you perhaps I can share tell us you a, a little tip, a little hint? A little, a little hint of what's coming? Well, I can tell you something that's coming because we've promised it to people in a very public way. It's not here yet. But remember how I said Deep Magic for Pathfinder was one of those keystone products for us? Well, Deep Magic for 5th edition happened about five or six years ago, and we have a new version of Deep Magic coming in October. 
It is a beautiful collection of spells, magical styles, um, familiars, ritual magic, subclasses for your every spellcaster type. Um, there's dream magic, there's battle magic, there's... Uh, I don't even want to tell you all of it, but it's, <laughs> it's our big holiday release um, is Deep Magic Volume 2. Uh, so it's worth looking for. It's in PDF, it's in print, and it's coming in October. Um, I would highly recommend it as a as a gift from players to their game master to say, hey, I would like to have, you know, 50 new paladin spells, please. Um, or, or there's also a lot of vile, evil, nasty magic in there. And, you know, every game master occasionally wants to say, well, he casts a spell and this happens and watch the party say, wait, what happens? <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's surprises in there. There's magic items. Um, and there's, uh, there's even an appendix that shows how all of those spells can be used in a Tales of the Valiant environment. So it's immediately compatible with the Tales of the Valiant playtest uh, materials and the alpha release of Tales of the Valiant. So that's coming. I'm very excited about it. I saw an advanced copy. It's beautiful. Um, and I imagine uh, it will it will find its way onto tables very, very quickly. So Wolfgang, thank you very much for this interview. I learned of course. a lot. Uh, you are really good at sharing what you love. I, I really felt uh, the the emotional part of what you were telling. So I, I wanted to also uh, tell you that because uh, it really came across this way as uh, as that. I, I, I felt thank it. you. I you know I think you'll find this a lot of people in tabletop. We're very passionate. We love what we do, and some of us are big and dramatic from the years of dungeon master. <laughs> <laughs> Leon, well, something else you, you want to know? <laughs> More uh, comments? Really, no. really thank you for this time. I hope thank everyone you. gets the, the, the warmth we, we felt in this interview. Yes. Because this, this was, this was uh, great. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the wonderful questions. And, uh, and thank you for everything you do.